Hello, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch, and welcome to this session on continuous integration, delivery, and deployment uh, to accelerate innovation and drive business results. So the structure of the talk is going to be mainly covering a little bit of the concepts and, how, and, and also talk about how important these DevOps practices are uh, in order uh, for your digital transformation journey. And I'll also talk uh, a little bit, I will explain a, a scenario on how you can use WS2 products and uh, how you can implement a CI-CD pipeline using uh, for the WS2 products uh, with uh, the, the usual DevOps tools. Okay, so what exactly is digital transformation? So this is a quote I got uh, from this digital analyst. Um, so he says that digital transformation is a realignment of or new investment in technology and business models to more effectively engage digital customers at every touch point in the customer experience lifecycle. So uh, make note of the keywords technology, business models, digital customers, and customer experience. So these are some of the words that I will be using over and over again during the course of my presentation. So we know that uh, across various industry sectors, organizations are heavily reliant on IT now. Um, so they need software to either manage or run their business. And, in the, and as seen in the recent past, there are various companies coming out of nowhere and coming out of nowhere to dominate a market sector. And the incumbents of that market sector do not know how to cope with that digital disruption. So they would sit down and they would wonder what they, what they have to do because it's, it's challenging and they're not ready for this sort of shift. And these people from nowhere, these companies from nowhere have come and taken over the industry. So what do they have to do? So they have to uh, think of ways to compete with them and also to leverage technology um, in order to compete with them and to come up with new ways for their customers to interact with them. Um, so that essentially means that these incumbents or these uh, organizations that have not embarked on this digital transformation journey, they have to become a digital business. So in order to become a digital business, they have to do these three things. So I'm going to uh, narrow it down to these three things. So first, they have to come up with novel digital products, services, and business models uh, uh, to compete and to you know, give amazing experiences to their customers. And, this, and they also have to uh, focus on feedback and trends and adapt accordingly. And the third point is they have to optimize operations. So today, in this talk, I'm going to talk more about optimizing operations. So when is the time? When do they have to you know, embark on this journey? So the time is now to rethink what an organization must do in order to compete with these disruptors and startups. Uh, so they have to essentially become software companies. So Traditionally, they, they may not have done traditional software development. They may not have uh, created applications before. But to compete um, and to survive, they have to become software companies. So essentially, software is eating the world. So why is a DevOps approach critical to achieve digital transformation? So we have digital transformation. And DevOps is the engine room for digital transformation. Right? So DevOps will enable you to go from concept to cash seamlessly. So DevOps, the whole point of DevOps is to uh, let your customers have the best features, the best innovation, and uh, the most competitively differentiating solutions as quickly as possible uh, for the benefit of the overall business. So that's the whole point of DevOps. And uh, 
in order to manage that sort of rapid delivery, the DevOps teams must accommodate that pace. And uh, you know, the DevOps teams have to uh, do that. And then in order to do that, uh, they must uh, use automation. And in order to use automation, they must uh, collaborate closely with other teams as well. Um, so also, a company must figure out what DevOps means to them. What are the DevOps principles that they must follow? So uh, once they do that, once these principles are figured out, and, how, and once they decide uh, what concepts or what principles they're going to stick to, the company, the developers, the DevOps team, they must rally around these concepts and uh, try to achieve uh, transformation, digital transformation, by optimizing operations. So these are some of the success stories when it comes to a high quality software uh, released rapidly at a massive scale. So we all know these uh, sites. So Facebook, Netflix, Amazon. So they all do things differently. So let's see what they are. So what do they do differently? They all, um, among other things, uh, frequently and iteratively deliver software. So they follow these agile methodologies. So they deploy smaller changes frequently, and they react fast so that they can get feedback from real users. Right? So what they do is the, the changes go to the customers, the real users, and they get the feedback. So for an organization, in order to release frequently and iteratively, they must use DevOps. And in DevOps, the entire process cycle is automated to achieve continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. So let's take a look at the three concepts individually. So I just want to check with everyone here. By show of hands, could you let me know if your company um, follows uh, a CI approach? OK. That's, that's great. OK, so something that we think is that CI is very common. So in here also, a lot of us use continuous integration. But um, I saw on a survey online that uh, this is a company that does DevOps for other companies. Um, so they've noticed that most companies don't have CI in place. It's not very common. Uh, especially in this digital transformation journey, uh, companies that are not software companies, companies that have to build software in order to become digitally transformed do not have these practices. So while, every, while these companies try to uh, be competitive by de developing software, they also have to have these operations in place, so which means they have to have this uh, CICD and CD or C... Um, C depth in place uh, in order to be successful. So let's talk about continuous integration. So continuous integration is a core concept uh, in DevOps where developers or development teams work uh, on various uh, source code or they have, they're working on different pieces of software and they have in independently and they have to uh, integrate this software and test them frequently. So that is the whole concept of continuous integration. So the goal is to reduce the risk of seeing integration hell. So before CI, um, continuous integration happened after the creation process. So you create the software, and, uh, and that may take about months or years. And after that, uh, the whole integration process happens. And then that's all hell will break loose because all sorts of problems come from everywhere, and then integration becomes a nightmare. But with CI, integration becomes a non-event, right? It, it's, part, it's part of what you do every day. So this is why continuous integration is beneficial, because you find the bugs fast, uh, you're able to fix them fast, and then uh, do things right. So to get started, you need to have automated testing in place. So CI in five steps. So 
apart from committing code uh, frequently. So we'll take a look at the five steps. So you have to have the tests in place. Uh, then there has to be a CI service, a continuous integration service like Bamboo or Jenkins to run tests automatically on every commit. And these changes should be integrated every day. So there's no point in, uh, you can't say that you're following continuous integration if you're not uh, integrating frequently or committing, uh, a developer must commit changes frequently and often and, um, and make sure that code is tested uh, at a very regular basis. So you have to fix the build if it's broken and write tests for every new story. Okay, so this can be a, a possible continuous integration pipeline. So first you code, and then you commit the code, and once you commit the code, that, uh, you have to build it, uh, and that also is automatic, and then you can introduce a static code analysis if you want, and unit tests, and then you can also do something like code coverage analysis, and then integration tests. So that is the main pipeline. Then also if you want to go ahead and deploy to staging and also do acceptance tests, that can be a part of the continuous delivery pipeline, but this can also be a continuous integration pipeline. So the main uh, aspects are coding, committing, building, do unit tests, and do integration tests. Okay, so let's talk about continuous delivery. Continuous delivery builds upon continuous integration. So in order to do continuous delivery, you have to have continuous integration in place. So what is continuous delivery? So this is making sure that your code is always ready to release, even if you're not going to deploy every change into production. Right, so the goal is to ship changes to customers early and often. So most businesses think, okay, so you might think, wow, uh, this means releasing uh, high quality software faster than ever before. Uh, that's, that's wonderful, that's great, but doesn't, it seems like there's a catch. But what, you, what, you're going, what, what businesses forget is that continuous delivery reduces the granularity of the releases. So that means you release small fixes or small changes frequently and uh, so because of that, uh, the users get those changes and even if you find bugs, these can be fixed uh, faster. So the whole point of this is um, you fail fast and you fix fast, right? And also when you make small changes and commit them or, or when you make small changes, you you'd usually find if there are any bugs, uh, you can localize the cause for the problem easily because the change is small. And also, if you find the bug, the time to fix it is also fast, and therefore it's not only about reducing the number of defects, but it's also about um, uh, fewer bug lifespan. Sorry. Sorry, shorter lifespan of the bug. <coughs> So to get started, you have to have a good CI culture in place, and you have to set up the continuous delivery pipeline. So this is a simple release flow. So continuous integration is what we covered earlier. So continuous delivery. Um, so you can have multiple environments. So depending on your organization's preference, it could be uh, you can have just a test uh, environment, or you can have a staging environment, both. Um, so we also have customers who have uh, a separate environment to do performance tests as well. So, and then you have the production environment. So continuous delivery can be, after all the integration tests, it's about uh, deploying uh, the software into various environments and performing relevant testing and going into production. So when you're deploying into production, uh, that process is manual. So the reason I'm emphasizing on this is I'm going to cover continuous deployment next. Uh, so here, the, here there is some sort of a, um, authorization or approval required to deploy into production. So let's talk about continuous deployment. So here the changes to the repository So here, the changes pushed to the repository are automatically deployed to production if they pass the tests. So earlier in continuous delivery, 
uh, you make the change, you commit the code, and if it passes the tests, uh, it does not get deployed into production automatically, right? But in this case, say I'm a developer, and I'm going to commit my code, and if it passes all the tests, it goes into production, and uh, that is continuous deployment. So continuous deployment is not for everyone. It all depends on the software you're building, and it all depends on how critical it is, and also depends on the principles uh, of your organization when it comes to the release of software. So to get started, you have a good continuous delivery culture in place. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that it's not a priority for you to figure out whether you should go ahead with continuous deployment or delivery. So what you just have to do is have continuous delivery culture in place so that if you do want to get into continuous deployment, it's uh, just a matter of automating that step. So that is continuous deployment. Um, so automating deployment, so you can uh, create deployment scripts to release changes to staging and production and launch deployment from the local machine. And then as a second phase, you can plug the deployment scripts onto the CI server and use them par as part of your CD pipeline. So this is how you can go from CD to CD, or let's call it CDEP, right? So continuous delivery versus continuous deployment. So the change here is that in continuous delivery, deploying to production is a manual process. But in continuous deployment, everything uh, goes up to production, and it's all automatic. OK, so feedback loop is one of those advantages you have in the CI CD process. So earlier, So with, the, uh, with continuous integration and uh, de de uh, delivery, uh, you, you, your developers get into the feedback loop. Right? So previously, the developers were excluded from the customer experience or customer value. And it took them months to develop software, and they never got feedback. So it's, well, they did, but it would take a lot of time. So in this case, um, they would know whether their code was useful or whether it passed the performance tests. Uh, if you know, they, they understand what features need to be developed, and uh, they are aware of the business use case, the end-to-end -end business use case, and basically it gives them more value and it's, it becomes a rewarding experience rather than not knowing uh, what, uh, what, what is happening with the code that they developed. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about how you can do CI CD with the WSO2 products. So this is how you can follow a CI CD process for the WSO2 products. So if an organization is planning on using WSO2 products, uh, they might already have an existing CI CD process. So maybe they would want to uh, follow that same CI CD process or maybe they would just have a separate CI CD process for the WS2 product related development. So, and software delivery would need to include both WS2 middleware and application changes. So, when you're using WS2 products and when you're trying to figure out a suitable uh, CI CD pipeline, these are some of those things that you need to consider. So, first, you need to look at the solution and deployment architecture. So solution architecture is needed because they need to understand what products are, being, uh, are going to be used and how you're going to uh, write artifacts for these products, right? And it's not only about the solution architecture. You need to know the deployment architecture. Uh, so let's say it's the enterprise integrator. They need to know how many instances of this enterprise integrator is going to be used in production because if they are planning on uh, creating the staging pipeline or the test pipeline, and if they want to replicate the production environment, then they need to have that knowledge so that they could have that set up um, so that their CI CD pipeline will work uh, as expected. And then you need to look at the infrastructure. So WS2 products can be deployed on physical machines, on virtual machines, and on containers. So this is also important to know so that when you are deploying, you need to consider that aspect. 
Then configuration. So WSL products uh, have to be configured in certain ways. Um, so that information also is import important because if you want to use a configuration management tool, uh, you need to know about it. So extensions and external libraries is also something uh, that something to consider. So let's say you're using the enterprise integrator, and if you want to write an extension, um, it could be a class mediator. So this means you're uh, extending the capability of the enterprise integrator by writing uh, some Java code. So this also needs to be tested, right? So then you need to figure out if there are any extensions, then how do we test that as well? Uh, you need to write the proper test cases for that and then um, you know, figure out how to do that. And then you need to figure out the tools, what tools are needed uh, to create a CI CD pipeline and then also figure out the CI CD pipeline for deployable artifacts. So deployable artifacts can be APIs, proxy services, um, sequences, and so on. So product updates is also something uh, you have to consider now that now we have uh, the WS2 update manager. So if you want to push updates into production, um, then you also have to uh, consider uh, the product update process. So these are some of the tools that uh, you can use. So, so this is an image I got from this site. I'm, I'm guessing you can't see that. Uh, so this, is, this gives an overview of all the DevOps tools uh, out there. So WS2 can work with most of these tools uh, in order to create a CI CD pipeline. Uh, so we have tools for collaboration to build, uh, testing, deploying, uh, so most of these tools can be leveraged uh, to create a CI CD pipeline. Okay, so let's take an example. Okay, so in this particular example, I'm going to have um, a dev development environment, a staging environment, and a production environment. So this is just a, this is, I'm not saying that this is how you should create a CI CD pipeline for WS2 products, it's just an example. So in when the dev pipeline, if, if all the tests in the dev pipeline uh, succeeds, or if all the tests are passed, uh, the CI server will trigger the staging pipeline where uh, the, the deployable artifacts will be deployed into the staging environment. And then if all the tests pass there, uh, the production pipeline will be triggered and uh, you can either automatically deploy everything into production or else um, manually deploy it. So it can be a C CD or a CDEP process. So dev pipeline. So let's take a look at how to do this. So I am, in this example, I am going to use the enterprise integrator. And let's assume that uh, I've written a few proxy services and some APIs. So you have to use the WS2 Developer Studio, which is um, a plugin for the Eclipse IDE. So we use WS2 Developer Studio to write artifacts for the WS2 products. So you have to create something called a Maven multi-module project. And under that Maven multi-module project, you can have various other projects. So if it's uh, an ESP project, uh, if it's enterprise integrator that you're using, you will have to create an ESP config project. So if it is a data service that you want to deploy in the enterprise integrator, then you have to create a data service project. So you have to create this Maven multi-module project and then commit that Maven multi-module project uh, into the source repository. So let's say you make a change um, and then you commit that change uh, to the source repository and then the CI tool, in this case, I've used Jenkins, they can uh, pull the SCM or you can use Git webhooks and trigger the dev pipeline. So when the dev pipeline is triggered, Jenkins uh, will use Maven to build the, the deployable artifact, which is the car file. So when you, when you build the CAP project under this multi-module project, you get a dev car file and this is the deployable artifact. So this artifact, will then be deployed into the dev WSO2 EI server, right? 
So the EI server could reside um, on premise, on EC2, and then you can conduct functional tests and integration tests. You can uh, make use of these tools. And if the tests pass, the staging pipeline will be triggered. So in this case, we are trying to replicate the production environment. Um, and in the production environment, uh, let's assume there are two uh, EI instances. So we have to have two EI instances already uh, as uh, the staging environment, in the staging environment. So we have the CEI tool, which triggers the test pipeline. Um, the Maven multi-module project will be checked out once again. And you create the test car file. So the reason why this car file is built again in this stage is because there are environment-specific information. Therefore, you need to build that uh, car file again. Okay? And then you can create that test file, test car file, uh, as actually the car file that should be deployed in the test environment. And then you deploy it to an artifact sync folder. So it could, uh, you can have deployment synchronization via rsync. Or else, if you want to create uh, Docker images, then you can use other tools and create a Docker image. And then deploy car file to test WSO2 server. Right? And once that auto deployment is done, you can carry out integration and functional tests and also do performance tests on the staging environment. And if, this test, and if these tests pass, the production pipeline will be triggered. And again, um, you can build the production car file. And um, so the rest of the steps will uh, be carried out depending on how you want to push everything into production. So you can deploy the artifacts to sync folder again, and then deploy the production WSO2 server cluster. And then you can carry out some smoke tests to see if everything's working out fine in the production environment. So that's the example there. So I also would like to talk a little bit about the WSO2 update pipeline, because if you want to automate that process as well. So WSO2 update manager is a command line utility. Okay, And it allows to get the latest updates available for a particular product release. So first, you need to download the WAM client uh, and then select the products to update. You have to check if any updates are available. You need to get the updates and push the updates to, en uh, to environments. So this is um, a particular one way that you can roll out updates. So you can use a configuration management tool like Puppet, Solstack, and Sybil or Chef and run the WAM tool. Then you get the updated product, and after, then you have to use that updated product. So the enterprise integrator in that third box is the updated enterprise integrator. And then you can get configuration data from um, the source repository and configure and deploy the products um, uh, using the configuration management tool. And then you can get the deployable artifacts that we spoke of earlier, uh, that is the car files, and they, you can then uh, deploy into that artifact synchronization folder and deploy into production. Um, so this is, I have, you, you can't see the complexities here, but this is pretty much uh, the standard approach how you could uh, create or how you can roll out updates automatically. So. In summary, to truly embrace digital transformation, uh, adopting the continuouses, that is CI, CD, and CDEP, uh, is no longer a nice to have, right? So with CI, CD, and that should be CDEP, you can transform and accelerate the software delivery pipeline. So speed to market can break a company or enable it to survive and thrive into the future. So we understand the importance of all this, and that is why if you're using WSO2 products in your digital transformation journey, you can follow CI-CD process uh, for the WSO2 products as well. So because it's all about creating and delivering amazing experiences, uh, your customers are living in this performance world where everything needs to be uh, fast and not slow, and there can't be any faulty applications. Uh, they would 
be demanding for things, they are fussy. So it's very important that you are able to deliver all of these things easily, um, and th which is why you need to optimize your operations and um, leverage CI, CD, and CDEP. So if you want to know more about um, uh, or, or know about more of these concepts and do it, uh, learn more about CICD or also about WSO2 updates, you can attend the DevOps track tomorrow. Uh, Chamit will be conducting these two talks, and I'm sure you'll find it very useful. So thank you very much for your participation. I hope you found the session useful. Do you have any questions? Um, hi. Um, hi. If you update via the Vum services, um, do you have to reconfigure the whole product again? So, oh, so the access to XML files and all these configuration files, are they processed again or do we have to do it manually? Okay, so right now the updates come um, as, you know, you have to update the product and you get a brand new product. So these configurations uh, will have to be done manually, but if you're using a configuration management tool, like Puppet, then um, you can easily configure the product um, using Puppet scripts. Right. So wh why is there no uh, mechanism to have a single build? I mean, if I, I stage from dev to integration to product, production, I have to build it every time. Why can't I just wave or weave the platform specifics thing later into the build? Why do I need to rebuild and repackage everything? Okay, so because you have, okay, so because, for example, if you have endpoints, and um, let's, for example, take a API, okay? Uh, an ESB API or an ESB proxy service which points to an endpoint. And that particular endpoint resides in that environment. So these endpoint details will change from environment to environment. That's clear, but my question is, why is there no possibility to have that um, in a separate configuration which uh, isn't affected by the build? Why, why does it need to be packaged into the same uh, core file? Wouldn't it be nicer or better to have it in a separate configuration which will be uh, resident on, on, the, on the platform itself? So I could chip one one core file from, I could ship the same core file from one, from one environment to the next without any changes or without any rebuild. So I'm really sure that what I run or what I tested or what I deploy is, is the core I yeah. tested. Okay. So right now, what you can do is, so this is how we do it right now. So you have a separate configuration file uh, with uh, parameters uh, for each environment, right? So right now that uh, that information is used every time a build is happened for a particular environment. So that is the model that we follow at the moment. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right, thank you very much.